like to explore some aspects of Taoism with you. And Taoism, again, is the ancient Chinese mystical tradition. With, uh, with interesting reverberations of the modern Einstein universe, and perhaps that is one of the reasons why the Tao Te Ching is published perhaps more frequently than any other book except the Bible. That is, more translations published. What are its relationships to the Einstein universe? Well, we could go into several programs on that. But its basic approach is organic. That is, it conceives of what they call the Tao that cannot be named, the source. Out of the source arises uh, the universe, this universe, that is governed by cause and effect, the Tao that can be named, the laws of the universe. It doesn't envision a supernatural world stretching out and controlling uh, this universe, but the, the Tao and the universe and the source from which came the universe are self-soul. Uh, they arise out of themselves. That's why when I said de a brain designed by whom? Designed by itself, arising out of itself. A universe, if you will, becoming conscious of itself. There is a... Um, uh, then further, they go on to say that each of us, contained within us, if we go back to our own source, and the journey they felt of meditation, of of knowing yourself was always returning, returning to the source, the uncarved lock, the raw silk of you. But when you return to this raw silk, this uncarved lock, it was the Tao, the same creative force of the universe itself. You are not separate from that from which the universe arose. Not only, and this is important, not only the named Tao, as we have said, uh, our ancestry goes back to the creation of this universe, for we are stardust made manifest. We are star folk. The very elements of our body go back to the beginnings of the universe when such elements were created in ancient suns, ancient galactic mothers. So that is our relationship, the parallel to the Taoist concept of the Tao within us is the Tao, the same basic energy of which the universe is created. But furthermore, they suggest, that the Tao within us is also the unnamed Tao. A parallel might well be that we are related to what Wheeler, John Wheeler, the cosmologist, calls hyperspace, out of which universes arise. So that it is not just that we are of the stuff of the universe, but beyond that more primordial creative urge of the void, the nothingness out of which universes arise, that we are related to that too. The Taoist would say to the unnamed Tao, uh, in a modern context, we would say, uh, we are not separate or distinct from the hyperspace out of which the universe was created in the Big Bang. So you can see the parallels.
But this was not, the Taoist concept was not cold and unemotional. Uh, they felt that in order to know who you were, to go back to your own source, you had to erase some of the patterns etched by society into your nature. Now, if you wanted to use a parallel, uh, you might say, uh, following uh, Richard Leakey, another anthropologist of his school, that much of our aggressive nature arose when we left the hunting and gathering stage, contrary to the theories proposed by Robert Audre and territoriality and so forth, but that our aggression arose uh, when uh, we left the hunting gathering stage and began to uh, plant seed and settle into certain valleys and build villages and then cities. The Taoists would say the aggressive pattern etched by society. And they say that in order to go back to your own source, uh, to that um, quiet center or the uncarved lock, you first have to etch away the etch away the aggressive pattern so imposed by your society. In other words, you can't want it. It's not a goal. It's not a celestial cupid doll that you can win by persevering. You can win it by not wanting it, by Wu Wei, by letting go, by virtues that the Taoists call compassion, moderation, and humility. Then they suggest you can go back past formless forms to what you were at the beginning, where nothing has a name, that is, no words, no divisions, no this, no that. You can't even name it Tao, you can't even name it the attributes of Tao. But when you, they say that when you reach this centeredness of you, this Tao of you, this, um, what you discover is that it's an extension of the Wu Wei, of not forcing things, allowing things to arise of and of themselves, self-so, uh, without, um, without effort. This is the, uh, oh, in such sketchy terms, the basis. But you see, the Taoist then relates to the bamboo leaf as a painter. He goes, or she goes, to the source of their own being, which is also the source the same being of the bamboo leaf. They become the bamboo leaf. They, it's not an objective consciousness measuring or citing the bamboo leaf. You go back into yourself, to the no mind of yourself. And there you meet the awareness, the same awareness that permeates the bamboo leaf or the fog and shrouded mountain, or the pine tree, or the apricot blossom, the cherry blossom. No distinction, sameness. And yet not, um, it's not a universe of gruel. The Tao expresses itself in its own uniqueness, in the snowdrop that cannot be duplicated, 
in the individual that cannot be replicated. If one were to talk in terms of science today, the modern analogy, you and I and the dolphin and the tiger, the bamboo and the raccoon, the lizard, the fish. Go back to that single molecule in the primeval sea that replicated itself. And out of this replication came such diversity. But we are related. We are cousins. We are not separate. We're not something new, uh, given dominion over this earth. We are of the stuff of the earth and cousins to all life. This is what the atomic scientists who, who write the bulletin of atomic scientists, the concerned scientists who are so concerned about the nucleus spread, say now we have seven minutes left to midnight. This is why they say, and quite realistically so, one world or none. Now, the ways of going back, the techniques for going back, of course, techniques is just that. It's just a, a way of, of attending to that which you want to attend. But the Taoist developed what they called uh, serene reflection. And this is just another way of approaching, of cultivating perhaps the two necessary ingredients in knowing yourself, in relieving the stress, in going back to who you are. And that is uh, attention Remember what I was saying about attention in terms of the modern brain. And attitude. Now, when you analyze attitude, what you're really talking about, if you want to deal with it, again, on a physiological level, you're talking about the correlation of the forebrain, that part of the brain which um, um, sort of takes charge, plans for tomorrow, or does not plan for tomorrow, let's go. Both are equally valid. But the relationship of the forebrain and the limbic system, the midbrain, the emotions, attitude is composed of that. So you see how intimately related this is to our knowledge of brain structure. I think that um, one of the most uh, descriptive um, approaches uh, to this concept of serene reflection or merely being aware of your own mind, what's going on in your own mind, is from a very famous Chinese verse, which I've read quite often, the 8th century. The wild geese fly across the long sky above. Their image is reflected upon the chilly water below. The geese do not mean to cast their image on the water, nor does the water mean to hold the image of the geese. This is serene reflection as creativity. When the geese fly above the water. They are free of any intention, casting the image on it. And certainly the water doesn't intend to preserve their image or reflect their image in flight. But at this moment, at this very moment, with the image of the geese in the water, their beauty is most purely reflected 
In this instant of reflection, time is space, and space is time. They merge at this one absolute point, here and now, the eternal moment, the point from which all beauty, all that is created, whether within us or within the universe, arises. We are reflecting the here, now, of creation in that moment of insight or in painting or in verse that moment of insight. I think another Chinese verse that expresses it so well an old pine tree preaches wisdom and a wild bird is crying out truth. The recognition of the oneness of you and the pine tree and you and the wild bird, if you will but hear and if you will but see. I think one of the most famous descriptions of this nature of serene reflection is uh, not by a Taoist at all, but by a Zen master who was very much influenced by Taoism, Hong Shu, of the Tsao Tung school. These, this school was not the koan school. This was before the koans. The koan was a very brilliant invention, but it was not the way the old Chan masters taught for 400 years. But just now allow this to be a meditation. Just go with it. If you're seated, uh, allow yourself to relax for a moment. Just tune into your breath for a moment, the in and out of your own breathing. And again, remember, Wu Wei, Wu Wei. There's nothing to prove here. There's nothing not to prove. And you're not going to be um, blessed with the great vision of all that is to come. Leave that to the prophets. But this is just tuning in. But in a way of tuning in, perhaps, tuning in to the Mother Universe itself. But this is what he wrote. Silently and serenely, one forgets all words. Clearly and vividly, that appears before him. When one realizes it, it is vast and without edges. In its essence, one is clearly aware singularly reflecting in this bright awareness, full of wonder in this pure reflection. Dew and the moon, stars and streams, snow on pine trees, and clouds hovering on the mountain peaks. From darkness, they all become glowingly bright. From obscurity, they all turn to resplendent light, infinite wonder permeates this serenity. In this reflection, all intentional efforts vanish. Serenity is a final word. Reflection is the response to all manifestations. Remember the wild geese over the pond. Devoid of any effort, this response is natural and spontaneous. Disharmony will arise if in reflection there is no serenity. All will become then wasteful, secondary, 
if in serenity there is no reflection. The truth of serene reflection is perfect and complete. Oh, look, the hundred rivers flow in tumbling torrents to the great ocean. The meaning of serene here in the original Chinese characters goes much deeper than just mere calmness or quietude. It implies transcendency over all words and thoughts. It denotes a state beyond. And the reflection, as used by the Chinese, likewise goes much deeper than ordinary sense of contemplation of a problem or an idea of thinking about how to solve a problem or an idea. It uh, simply has no taste of mental activity or of contemplative thought, but it is a mirror-like awareness, ever illuminating and bright in its own pure self-experience. More concisely serene in the Taoist and early Zen meaning meant the tranquility of of no thought that is of no words and no images and reflection means a vivid and clear awareness and therefore serene reflection is a clear awareness of the tranquility of no thought and this is really what the Diamond Sutra meant when they suggest not dwelling on any object, and yet the mind arises, yet the mind arises. So they're saying the mind is not just the thoughts or the images, but the mind in, the Buddhist, in this Buddhist concept is the Buddha, the Buddha mind, the ordinary mind, the awareness which going back to the hypothesis that I suggested that flows through the brain when the switch is on. It's an interesting. The Taoist poets and uh, indeed the Zen poets approached their poetry like painting. In fact, most painters were poets. They really did not distinguish between the two. And by that I mean poetry that is their, their mystical poetry, their contemplative poetry, was not overlaid with rich symbolism. What they were interested in was capturing that moment of beauty in the simplest and most direct fashion possible. Just as as in a Chinese scroll painting of a mountain. The top is nothingness, the fog enshrouding the peak, and yet you sense the peak behind the fog. The pine trees are very accurate in their reflection of pine trees, but they're only a brushstroke. And somewhere in that vast scroll of towering mountains and mountain streams, torrents, and pine trees, is a tiny little figure of a person. In contrast, say, to Western paintings where 
you always see the person forefront, uppermost, the foreground, the garden, the background. Just a difference in approach. They felt that the pine tree was equally important, and so was the sh fog and shrouded mountain. But their poetry, in they, were, they had all manners of poetry, of, uh, poetry, of course, schools of poetry. But their contemplative poetry attempted to allow you to experience that moment with the poet, and not to superimpose some image of the moon was like a a sailing vessel. They felt that was uh, gilding the lily. Uh, simply not needed. You merely describe the fact that the moon was there. Or, in this fashion, one of my favorites was I've shared with you quite often. In front of my bed, the moonlight shone. For a moment, I took it for frost on the floor. When I lifted my head, I saw that it was the moon. When I bent my head, I dreamt of my far away home. In Taoist poetry, as in early Zen poetry, the full moon was always a symbol of the void, the nothingness, uh, the Tao that cannot be named. So, when he bent his head, he dreamed of the source from which he came, the source from which all come. The other characteristic of Taoist poetry and indeed early Zen poetry is that this tranquil death uh, depth that reflected in the original simplicity is never sober, is never grim, is never preaching. It's always full of a very simple, almost childlike joy. A primordial innocence. The first time seeing of the child the thing that Maslow talks about, and peak experience. The luminous joy, the innocence and the joy are really two aspects of this ontological experience, this intuitive self-awareness, which is totally different from discursive thinking. It's an uncarved block. It's formless, soundless, colorless. And yet, latent within it are all forms and all sounds and all colors. Just as latent in hyperspace, if you accept that hypothesis of Wheeler, are all universes, parallel and strung out together. The creative process of the universe is also the creative process of the poet who transforms his or her ego into self, and thus has become a part of the universe. You see the, the difference in the treatment of ego? Not the transcendence of ego, but the transforming of the ego into self, and thus becoming part of the universe. It's just a little different approach. Now, another... This is a poem, really, it's oftentimes among poets, where the Taoist path and the early Zen paths of Chan uh, really naturally converge, the distinction between them sort of vanishing progressively. Uh, let me read it. It's just a little different than the rest of this, and I don't think I've ever shared it with you before on the air. It's a longer poem. Starts out by saying, do not prattle of the void. Oh dear, I wish that advice would be <laughs> kept today. So much prattling. 
about spiritual truths, the void, karma, all the things that, that if you were face to face you really wouldn't want them. For, uh, I don't know whether you'd be willing to give up. But anyway, do not prattle of the void, not knowing what it means. For those who seize upon it very easily get lost. Should you really wish to know the truth about the void, it's vast and undivided expanse of shining mist. Notice that contrast. Practical, do not prattle about the void. Really want to know about it. its vast and undivided expanse of shining mist. The nature of the myriad forms is void, not nothingness. Whereas nothingness contains the workings of creation, within the void no grain of dust finds place to lodge. There's not but golden light where the magic pearl is seen. A student of the way seeks the truth of life and death. For else he longs in vain to win in mortal state. For he who knows life's source discerns death's meaning too. If you know your own source, if you've visited your own uncarved lock and your own raw silk, the Tao of you, you know the meaning of death. You know it has no terror, no barriers. For that is what it's all about. The source of you is the creative source of the universe, of all universes, even unto hyperspace. But continue to win in mortal state. But he who knows life's source discerns death's meaning too, and thenceforth is set free to live spontaneously. From first to last there is no dying or being born. From a flash of thought a myriad false distinctions spring to mind. But when to know just where those thoughts arise and vanish, a radiant moon shines forth in the temple of the mind. And there before you lies the truth, that there is nothing to be sought. Of themselves the hills are green, and of themselves the waters flow. Let the mind by night and day embrace this single thought, by thought wherein there's no thought, must one cultivate the way. It's uh, quite profound. Li Feng, uh, one of the early poets, he often referred to the Tao as... Uh, the mistress of wonderful clarity, and wrote so often of the coral clouds, symbolizing the beauty of the mind. Uh, listen to this. Wreathed by coral clouds, the mountains stand out vaguely, still clad in mortal frame. He lingers on the blue-green slopes of his solitary valley, veiled in white mist where none disturb him and soon he will win a spiritual body and be seen no more uh, by the spiritual body there they don't mean quite the same as the um, as we mean by the spiritual they mean it becomes uh, of the of the universe This is the um, another approach to stillness, a Taoist approach. Swiftly runs the stream, greenly tinged by fragrant grasses. The ancient pines are dyed with the bluish tint of distant mountains. Standing where the water gushes, I raise my flute, and child and mortals gather in the cave to hear its music. And below the cliffs, mist clusters thickly, and still no one comes. 
Softly white clouds descend, oh, softly, veiling the greenish moss. The pines have thickly carpeted the earth. Hushed now the birds. A light breeze fans my wanderer's pillow, bringing dreams. Another. To those who know the secret, there's not a single thing. They learn to give things up and simply practice stillness. Closing their gates at dawn, they read till evening falls, then sweep the floor and light a stick of fragrant incense. All day they battle with the six robbers called the senses until they recognize that shapes and forms are wholly void. Then awake to the truth that there's not a single thing. That the magic mirror stand exists only in the mind. When sense reactions cut, self-transformation follows and stillness dawns and form is recognized as void. The Buddha is your mind. Your mind is just the Buddha. Green mountains are white clouds in a passing transformation. Again, note poet's approach. He tries to see things as they actually are and not to distort their actuality. A famous line that's used so often, or lines that are used so often, as an illustration of this way of expression is the wintry ripples in the lake gently move away White seagulls lightly swoop down. Nothing more than that. Now, the poet merely brings out the objective reality grasped by him in a moment of his own, how can one say it, non-ego self is revealed. The great self reflects things, but does not change them. So that from the realm of this centeredness. Now, this is not the Tao. This is a creative level above the Tao. It is a, for lack of a better term, a, an ego form self. You're still seeing with the senses and celebrating with the senses. But you're seeing the oneness inherent within all the myriad of forms. Uh, the Western mystic would say that this is, um, well, this is the same experience as Meister Eckhart talks about. And seeing that a blade of grass is a blade of grass and a stone is a stone and a tree is a tree and yet not obliterating the differences, but yet seeing within the very depths of those differences the oneness that permeates all and permeates the observer too. It is this level, from this level, that the Chinese poet writes. Another, another illustration of that. With tears in my eyes, I ask the flowers to share my sorrow. Alas, the flowers all remain silent, and the scattered petals blow away to the swing. 
the poet pers uh, personifies the flowers by projecting his feelings upon them. And silence is really the actuality of the flowers. But the poet's brush, the silence of the flowers and the floating petals becomes the poet's own subjective feeling. They express not only serenity, but sometimes emotional inflicts, uh, conflicts, inner tension, especially after um, perhaps too much wine drinking. Taoist poets love their, their rice wine. A very famous painting. I think it's so lovely. It shows the Confucian the Buddhist priest and the Taoist hermit, drunkest thieves in a bamboo grove, playing the lute and understanding each other. Would that we could be permeated by such a spirit. But here is a melody reflecting um, anxiety. Withered leaf vine, withered vine, rotten tree, dark crow, little bridge, running stream, homestead, worn out road, western wind, lean horse. The sun is setting in the west, and the broken hearted man is at the end of the earth. That gives you just a little other side. And in contrast again, through quiescence and void, confusion is dissolved. As the white cloud breaks up when they reach a wintry cliff, spiritual light dispels the darkness as the moonlight follows the vessel. Finally, in the night, the bells of the mountain temple are swung by the wind from the pines, and from my bed of stones, by the wintry lamp, I can hear the flowering rain of Buddha. The mist rise up to the mountain peaks. They are submerging the temple, and through the scattered trees of the forest, I see the river down the valley. That directness that lucidity. Spring breezes sweep the green meadows, the rains have stopped, but from the bamboo leaves the water still drips, and suddenly a white bird appears on the scene. He breaks the green universe of the mountain slope. Thank you for sharing this time with me. Peace.